Do you like the Carpenters? I, I, you know, I like their early work, but when they started getting preachy, I tuned out. Right. And I found an alternate, Jeremiah Sands. Oh, wow. His music is translucent. He's a righteous man, genius. Yeah, he is. You know who's righteous? Nicolas Cage. Fuck yeah, he is righteous as shit. <laughs> because we got two bits of Nicolas Cage, and I, before we even talk about these films, first and foremost, what I'm kind of curious is, is everyone's history with Nicolas Cage. Because if you look at his body of work, which is, it's intimidating. It's mm -hmm. like, you know, SAT scores that are really high. They're intimidating. Yeah. From the get-go, from when he was Nicolas Coppola. Yeah. And his cameo appearance in Fast Times at Ridgemont High, he's one of Brad's friends at the beginning. Um, he looks she, like the kind of guy that would hang out with Brad. Well, you know, he, he's one of those fast food guys. He's, you know, waxing his car on Getting the weekends. Ready. Yeah, like, hoping no bees get in my car. He's not cool enough to hang with Spicoli in the gang. No. He's kind of working his way up. Yet. But he eventually worked his way up into Valley Girl, which, how long has it been since you've seen Valley Girl? It's been a minute. It's I been extremely long i think 88 wow since i've seen it so it has been a spell it's been a you need minute to revisit i need to revisit number one it's got classic cage and i mean we're talking youthful cage where yeah. he is still cut like a god his chest hair is in a superman s in valley girl which again as someone it, that has the hairy chest that's my people but it also makes sense that it's nick cage and he loves some superman deborah foreman in that movie with eg daily Next level, mm. which leads me to Moonstruck. I love Moonstruck. I've seen Moonstruck like six times. Moonstruck is so fucking How good. many times? Six times! And I don't even like Cher. Like, I'm not even a big Cher fan, but Moonstruck, there's something magical about that movie. Uh, it's, it's, it's great. Sounds like you turned back time and saw it <laughs> multiple times. And Cage in that movie... It's phenomenal. He's next level. He lost his hand. I lost my hand. Mm -hmm. You see early on... The level of madness, the rage in the cage, but he was still young and hungry. Where he got, did he get nominated for an Academy Award for Moonstruck? Yeah, or was that was that share? I can't remember. No, I think I know he got alcohol. He got something. Yeah, people were like, "Who's this Nicolas Cage kid?" I remember Nick Cage. I think my first movie where I saw him was Peggy Sue Got Married. Oh, oh Peggy Sue, yeah. Hey, you, my Wang. Right. I saw that fucker in the theater. Wow. Yeah, but I haven't seen it since. I have not seen it since either. I remember Jim Carrey being in that, and Joan Allen. Like, it's a cavalcade of all of our favorite character, character actors, yeah. including Nick Cage now, Raising Arizona. I love Raising Arizona, but I think when I first started noticing Nick Cage, Nick Cage was Con Air. Which Con Air and Rock to Time. The action mm -hmm. Nick Cage, which a lot of people are familiar with. Con Air, The Rock, The Rock. Welcome to The Rock. Face off. I can eat a peach all day. <laughs> which... I forgot Peaches were in this film, which missed opportunity, but we'll get to that. But the Actioneer Cage, and then all of the other ones, Snake Eyes. Yeah. Weird the, drama, 8mm, and like... His working with Machine in that movie. 8mm is one of those movies that I, I did also see in the theater, and I'm not ashamed to say I enjoy it, because it's been a while since I've seen it, but I remember Peter Stormare in that. <laughs> yeah. James Gandolfini. Everyone being nasty. Very nasty. It's, well, a, it's a movie, movie about snuff movies. So, yeah, yeah, uh, it's, what, it's what you expect. It's when you enter the world of Dino Velvet, <laughs> better than Bobby Peru. <laughs> Speaking of Wild and Heart, no, um, but I don't think Nick Cage became Nick Cage until the one-two punch of Ghost Rider mm -hmm. and The Wicker Man. Yeah, once The Wicker Man came out, and he's like the bees, and he's kicking like school arms through windows and dressing up like bears and cold clocking people. That movie was hilarious. I saw it in the theater, and I laughed so hard. Much, much more entertaining than Midsommar. Yeah, we'll, we'll get you even. But, <laughs> shots fired. <laughs> but at the same time, I think that's when he got the yeah. notoriety of him being unhinged and insane. And there's some movies where that doesn't help. No, He's got this it, movie called Between Worlds. That movie is bad shit, and is, it's not Good. Okay, and is that the one where he's like Nick Cage, where he can view Nick Cage movies or... No, okay, like so basically in Nick Cage, he meets this psychic who can only contact the dead when she's being choked out, okay? Okay. So he tries to... He plays a long-haul trucker who chokes out the psychic in a bathroom and winds up becoming her friend. She has a teenage daughter who's 17 years old. 
He's trying to get a hold of his dead wife. The dead wife inhabits the body of the teenage daughter. Oh, no. And seduces Nick Cage because oh, no. he's forming a relationship with the psychic mother. Oh, no. There's a scene in this movie. I shit you not. I saw this in the theater. It was a film club thing. The entire theater lost it at this point. He's having a sex scene with this the teenage daughter while he's reading the biography of Nick Cage. Cage. There it is. And he's reading his own biography out loud, mind you, while he's having sex with his dead wife in the body of a teenager. It is fucking bizarre. Fucking bizarre. But like you said, it's not necessarily the cage you want. And what I find No, that wasn't the cage I wanted. No, well what I find interesting though are the folks out there that are such a fan of cage, and don't get me wrong, I love it when people obsess and are fanatics. Like, for example, when we saw Colorado Space, I remember every time he said something, whether it was funny or whether it was just it exposition, got it, it got a laugh. And it was like, that wasn't funny. I think no. that was Nick Cage being... See, that's the thing. There's the Nick Cage appreciates and yes. the Nick Cage um, mockers. Yeah. And so you can be in... We're Nick Cage appreciates. We can Love have, the man. We can... Yeah. I love Raising Arizona, Wild at Heart, fucking all these other movies. Bad but Lieutenant. So not, good. No, no. His movies are great. Not fucking Between Worlds was awful. And we don't celebrate the entire catalog. No, but of we Cage. do appreciate, and we do know that he has a lot of good acting chops inside of him when he can deal with it. But these two movies, these aren't the rage cages we wanted, but these are the rage cages we absolutely needed. Yes, we did. So let's get into Color Out of Space from 2000, and in this case, uh, 19. We, I, so my the background color. with this is the color. Uh, I remember watching this for the first time at Panic Fest here at Screenland in Theater One mm -hmm. in the, the front. And I only mention the front because I shared my spot with someone who likes to be in the front. She is a blonde. She's the blonde in front. I sat there and I enjoyed it with Katie Glidewell, which was awesome. A great person to enjoy any movie with. Yes, yes. especially that film. And I distinctly remember reacting to the movie. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember squirming a lot in my seat because of all the nastiness that eventually hit with this film. Now, I do remember that was the second time you watched yes, it, correct? Yes, that was the second time. When was the first time you engaged with uh, Color Out of Space? About four days before Panic Fest. Yep. We had it at uh, Film Club. Um, and we watched it, and we were fucking stoked because it's a Richard Stanley movie. And if you don't know who Richard Stanley movie is... I implore you, go see The Lost Souls, The Island oh, of Dr. Moreau. Such that, a great documentary. It will give you so much insight and be like, yes, that is Colorado Space is 100% a Richard Stanley film. Um, but yeah, I saw it and I was like, I got to see this movie again. It's so wild. It's, it's these, both, both these movies, and I've seen a lot of movies, are very unlike anything I've ever seen. Yes, Distinctly different, yes, and ones that you can pretty much guarantee you can you can recommend these to a hardcore horror fan mm -hmm. and be okay, hardcore sci-fi fans, yeah, just a hardcore genre fan, hardcore I think. Lovecraft enthusiast, yes. hardcore Cage fanatic, yes. you know, just don't show it to anybody who's a big fan of alpacas. No, well, you know, they are the animal of the future for a reason, genius. I, the alpacas got me, and it was the milking of them, and then. You're lost there. Genius, You're you would have you would have had to bypass the alpaca milk. Just like there. he says, I'm lactose intolerant. You're lost. <laughs> Whoo! Dodging a bullet. Um mm -hmm. so this was actually the second time I got to revisit it here on Shudder. And a lot of the stuff hit me the way I remember it hitting me in the mm -hmm. theater. But then there were little bits and pieces of the family dynamic that when watching these films back to back, you realize that they really are movies about ab family. About relationships. Yeah. What do you do when things get bad? Do you come together as a family? Do you splinter apart? What to, do you do to protect your family? Yes. And if shit goes down bad, what would you do to avenge Avengement. your family? Yeah. This is ve these were both two weird sides of the same coin, but extremely different movies. Well, and then even with Nick Cage in this one, there are elements where he's very reserved in his normal dad mode. 
But then once the color out of space comes in... And once he breaks out into that weird voice that he does. I got bits of vampires kissing that with Peter Lou. I'm Peter Lou. That makes 100% correct because when Richard Stanley... So Richard Stanley, when they were coming together, he fir- uh, first want, didn't know if um, Nicolas Cage could do it. But then he talked about it. And he goes, I want to see your performance from Vampire's Kiss. Okay, good. Okay. And that was because that's Richard Stanley's favorite Nicolas Cage movie. And he goes, That is what I want. And I got it when you hear him channeling either. Why don't you get the fuck out of my sight? Or I'll better yet, I'll get the fuck out of yours. (laughs) And it came out of almost nowhere. But it was hinted at that his dad had a drinking problem. Uh huh. And definitely a rage problem. Yeah. And there were moments when even they said, when uh, Jolie Richardson's care is like, this shit's going down and that's what you choose to do. He's like, that's what I do. Well, what else what am I going to do? It was, it was an interesting, at first you don't get it. You're no. like, what the fuck is he doing? And then when you realize that that's not really him yeah. speaking, you're like, it's a different voice. It's the color out of space affecting everyone. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting because, have you ever seen The Curse with Will Wheaton? No. I, I was thinking The Crush the, with Carrie Eels. And I, and like, Alicia Silverstone. Different film. So this is actually a remake of The Curse, because The Curse is... Is uh, based on Color Out of Space. Yes. So it's interesting, because I it's been a long time since I watched The Curse, because I went to it from Toy Soldiers, Will Wheaton. Well, um, step by step, they all fall down. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> left, right, left, we all fall down. Fall down. Like Toy Soldiers. That fucking song was the shit. That movie's the shit. Yeah, it I'm is. I'm a big fan of that one. Yeah, but, it is. But I was familiar with the material and the content, and what they did with it and how they changed it, I think, made it a little bit more contemporary. Made it more tangible, too. And incorporated technology, because the technology was also affected. Mm-hmm. This is the... Uh, multi- this is the... I know that at least the second film, where you need to avoid the water. With the beach house... Holy and this sh- one. I know. I was thinking that. Like, what is there's something there's something in the water. Which why didn't they drink more wine? He had that awesome wine cellar, which also I'm just in terms of connections, I immediately went arachnophobia, Julian Sands and Warlocks. Warlocks. Which with Richard Stanley and him. It makes a hundred percent because Richard Stanley actually is a practicing warlock. He like, legitimately he is. He legitimately is. Like before every, before every movie, he does some sort of ritual and summoning compared to to what he's going to do like during the island dr moreau he did a very druid um uh very druid centric and animalistic mm-hmm. ritual for the animal makes sense with moreau and for this movie he actually him and i have it written down because i can't fucking pronounce it, it is <laughs> that means it's good swedish filmmaker henrik molia right that is correct they actually went and did a Lovecraftian ritual to the god Yog saroth who is like the leader of the Elder Gods. I heard him name dropped, I'm not joking, in a Morbid Angel song. Yog saroth It's like a joke, but it's really not. They no. have a, a, so- a song called The Ancient Ones, and they name drop all these Lovecraftian old ones. Yeah. It's so metal. But it see, is so the, metal. That's the cool thing. Like a lot of people are getting into Lovecraft now. I mean, even though he was kind of a terrible I was gonna person. I was going to say he was a racist person. Yeah, he's yeah. kind of a terrible person, but yeah. again, art versus I the artist, separate it, right? But like he's got some very cool, very cool stories and like the where everybody everybody nowadays is familiar with Cthulhu. Mm-hmm. But there's so much more. So many old ones to unearth, right? Old ones like Yog Sarath. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh my god. Tiamat. Uh, yes. Um, uh, um, Sathuman. Siabzu Clench. I'm, now I'm trying to think of the Morbid Angel song and all the lyrics involved in it. Um, but it's not a monster movie. Mm-mm. It is very much a... Cronen- it's, it's, it's Space Cronenberg. It is, because we get some hardcore body horror. Yeah. In fact, it's it really takes its time to amp up to everything, it's, which I enjoyed, because I enjoyed working with the family and spending time with them. Not only that, but... Richard Stanley has such a thing for color and music yes. and and everything. Before we get the color, how dark and dreamy and like even the opening scene from the trees to her doing that spell. Yeah, and the weird opening where he's like, 
everything went nuts. Is it before he the, they they told stories that the water the well is cursed and like all that stuff. And you're thinking again, you don't know what the no nope. fuck is gonna go ha- what's gonna go on yep. because again, like with any Lovecraft story, oh. you have no clue what's what what lies ahead. Throw reason out the window. Yeah, it has no place. And so then I was like, this is actually pretty dread inducing with the color and then you realize that this is a very loving family there's not like like um lavinia is super fucking cool she just yeah and you know what i noticed her spell works because as she goes please protect me and get me out of here and That's what true. happens she was the only one that really didn't get super affected right. by the color and it got her out of there yeah it's so there are, I think, multiple ways that you can read the film. Um, now, the music itself... Music was sweeping and haunting and beautiful. I, it was, but there were times, and I don't know, maybe it was the sound mix on Shudder, but I had a hard time where there were points I really wish the music would have died down a little and actually let me hear what they were talking about. So I don't know, maybe it was just on my end with bad audio. I don't know how it was with you guys, but it I, took me I, out of it a little. I didn't get that. Okay, I, and again, I, maybe... maybe First world problems here on my end, ladies and gentlemen. But it was just one of those things that was notable this time around. Mm-hmm. Um, now, we do get a cage freakout in both of the films. Yeah. They're both solo freakouts, and both kind of serve the same purpose. But the freakout in here is the one in the car. I liked that one. Yeah. I I didn't think it was over the top. And both screenings that I've at theaters, when that thing happened, people laughed. Yes. And I'm like, again, maybe I'm reading too much into it, but like, He's going through some shit. Like he's he's being possessed mm-hmm. already by oh. his father, who he hates. And he's the, got that weird skin rash, that alopecia from hell or whatever it is. Uh, uh, alopecia, I believe. Alapaca. 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 It's the the rash of the future. <laughs> and um, and like he's his family is fucking falling apart. Yes. Like he doesn't know what's going on, and I could see him freaking out. Every, the horses are gone. The well is dried up. Everybody's acting fucking weird. All the way from your little kid who is uh, interacting with the meteor shit. Um, and shit. everyone kind of has their own relationship with the color out of space. Uh-huh. Even um, Ezra out there, Tommy Chong. Okay, so fucking I'm glad to see Tommy Chong in like not a Chong role. It's always kind of cool to see that. But it was 100% Tommy Chong. Like completely. 100% completely. Tom. And I was like... It was kind of rad, too, because, like, where's your brother? Oh, he's probably out getting high with our squatter, right? And I'm thinking, if Tommy Chong lived on my property, I would be fucking hanging out with him all the time. Jay's not here, man. No, it's me, Jay. Open the door, you know? Well, he's living off the grid. He's living via solar energy. With his cat, G-Spot. G- Can't find the G-Spot, unfortunately. Um, but he, it's it, and apparently that's not in the novel, which makes sense. Right. But it adds to it. It just gives you another character and another semblance of the family. The fact that they're so isolated mm-hmm. from everything. Fuck all that noise again. I am a city kid, hundred percent through and through, because I like being in yelling distance if somebody's fucking with me. You know, I don't want to be in like some sort of murder barn. No, it's it's it plays on the feeling of isolation. In fact, when they had the mayor coming out, it's like this better be worth it. Like yeah. I'm coming out a long way here for you. Um, Missatonic University, of course, in the background there. Uh-huh. Lovecraft all over. Oh, this and movie. then like they're like, and don't forget though, there's a storm coming in through Innsmouth, Innsmouth. and Dunwich and like yep. and you just start name dropping all these other things, and I'm like this is like the fucking Stephen King universe where like and things happen in Derry and blah, blah, blah. The only thing they were missing is them reading a book by Sutter Kane. Yeah. Like if we could have had that, but we could make that inner. They inner... were reading the Necronomicon and the Necronomicon is 100% from Lovecraft very Lord. True. They're, they're again, Missatonic University, all this stuff. Very, very, um, very great on the. Uh, Keep going. I'm going to make sure where the sound is okay on that side. Yeah. No, I really enjoyed the different aspects of it. The, the fact that, like, if you didn't know it was 100% love, uh, Lovecraftian, it's okay. You will. But for those of you who are familiar with, like, the Lovecraft themes, those little name drops and shit was like, oh, the tentacles are coming out. It's quiddly diddly. No, I thoroughly enjoyed this movie. This movie is fucking wild. Um Everybody loves ducks. <laughs> it that didn't look very appetizing. That little I don't concoction. know. I I've eaten some uglier shit that came out delicious. Peasant food. But well, that's always the good stuff. That's like, like uh, the um, ratatouille, if you will. It's just a combination of all the good stuff. And that's kind of what this is. It's a combination of a lot of good stuff from Richard Stanley. Speaking of, did you see No Flesh Shall Be Spared right over his? Uh, 
computer. Yep. Yeah. I was like, that is a lovely hardware nod. It's well, and if you all haven't seen hardware, I'd even recommend checking out our conversation we had with Joe Lynch mm-hmm. at Panic Fest, our talk with hardware and all things Richard Stanley. In fact, not only did we talk hardware, but we talked short circuit too, where Los Locos They'll kick your ass. Yeah, Los Locos will kick your face. Los Locos will kick your color out of outer space. You're welcome. <laughs> so, I was like, yeah, that one kind of leads into that one there. Uh, final thoughts before we transition over to Man. No, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I thought it was fantastic. Um, no, uh, let's see. When the mom cut the finger off, that we 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 we, oh, we, 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 we oh, no, there, we got more to talk about oh, before God. we go to Mandy. We got oh, a lot. God. We yeah. we've only talked about Nick Cage and Richard Stanley. We haven't even talked about the movie proper. The when the color out of space gets the mother and the kid. That broke my fucking heart. The reveal to this day, I knew it was still coming. And when you get that overshot and you see the connection. Oh. Oh. But even before that, I liked how everything was very, very subtle. Mm-hmm. Like there was like a one little blue flower or red flower. And then oh. there was a couple of red flowers. And it's then there was slowly more. but surely. And then there's a kid. Hey, look at all these vegetables. Yeah. Oh. I could eat a peach. Oh, never mind. You know? And so like. I was looking for that. Thing. Right. But then it started getting weird, and you saw the animals started fucking up. And even before that, when the lights, every now and then the light had like a lens flare with that mm-hmm. color, and it was just enough to be like, there's something very, very wrong where your spider senses are tingling. And then finally, when, when you see the Lovecraft, the, the, the dark praying mantis, and he comes out, and he has the squiddly diddly yes. in his mouth, and like that, and I'm like, oh, this is fucking red! And even when you see the color as it's manifested... yeah. It's all tentacles. Have you seen Annihilation yet? Uh, it's on my list. Okay. It would pair nicely with Color Out of That's Space. It's called The Shimmer, the right? The Shimmer, yes. But both take these concepts of something as simple as color and how something like that is just normally a decoration thing for us and how, no, it's actually going to be the tool to your death. Yeah. Um, the body horror that happens with her. When she starts escalating and transforming even more, that above shot... Of her scurrying, and she's got like oh. three legs, and two of them are sticking out, and everything. That made my legs go up, cause scurry is scary, and especially when it's like some sort of weird mixture of your family members. And what was worse about it, the sounds of oh, pain. It's not pleasant. The sounds that they were making was so, and you could hear like the bones melt and everything and then again when it has the alpaca this is like richard stanley's the thing yes and it was just like ah and you have to kill you you don't want to see alpacas die especially when they're like cute well yeah it it is the animal of the future for a reason my friend but then even the cat got fucked into with a big it looked like the panic fest cat yeah it really did with the three eyes and the skinless and like ah, the big and then you claws the big old mess of animals in the truck as well so you get a lot of inside out and they found g-spot yeah they did <laughs> turns out it we won't go but there. you know what you don't think you think because you're spending so much time and really caring for this family mm-hmm. that they're all going to make it out okay well and as we found out and as we saw that's not necessarily not the in case. a lovecraft movie not no. in a lovecraft movie it was heartbreaking when one the kid has to get put down the kid and the mom. And the mom. And it still doesn't work. <laughs> no, it doesn't. <laughs> and then when the brother gets eaten by the thing in the well, which we never see, just engulfed in the it, color. Mm-hmm. And you're like, oh, man. You would think like they, maybe he survived or something. And then again, you're like, okay, Lavidia seems to be the only one who knows kind of what's going on mm-hmm. and has been. But she's over there freaking out. Oh, do all that. Oh. Etching runes into. And there was always that, that, that specter of self harm when like the mom was like well look how you're dressed even though that wasn't really the mom talking right. at that point right still she's she's over there like really hurting herself to like numb the pain mm-hmm. and so when the all the pain of everything and she's having to carve those runes and she's doing it almost out of necessity yep and it's just but she's doing it with like not even thinking that was a haunting scene and then you think okay maybe she'll survive because she does realize she gets there- what their master plan was right. and planet squiddly diddly and all that stuff which was fucking dope 
that I forgot about that as well. And Planet that was Squidly introduced. Diddly? Oh, I'm off into space. Don't dream. It. All we need to see is you just being passed along throughout that little like like I'm thing. like stage diving, ah. right? <laughs> But then when you see that it's just there too, like, I'm just going to terraform the fuck out of you guys. Sorry, yep. you know? Yep. And you're just like, holy shit. And it ends so bleak. So bleak. Like, it's, don't it's, drink the water. Um, and that's why, technically, I wanted to make sure we ended with Mandy, because at least Mandy kind of has a more of an upbeat ending, potentially. But it was... The scariest things about it, about that movie for me, wasn't necessarily the monsters or the uh, fact that things are changing, but it's the fact of what was changing to the people yeah. we just realized the mom had a very bad cancer scare yes and nicholas cage when he's in his dad voice it's got that cancer smell that smell of death and rotting you know the smell more better than anybody and i'm like dude you are fucking mean that is the meanest thing i've heard you know and mm -hmm. like in a while and i'm just mean and so it's like god that broke my heart when because just the look of like how could you say that? Well, it's that's why I think this movie works as well as it does, because it does work as a Lovecraft movie. It works as sci-fi. It works as horror. It works mm -hmm. as Nick Cage. It works as a family drama. Yeah. And it works as a Richard Stanley movie, which is, prop for me, still the best part of it. Oh, yeah. That not only is he working again, but he did a hell of a film. He did a great, you know, great, this great is, job. This is how you come back with something like that. Uh, what else on your list here that we have not talked Ooh, about? Ooh, when he kissed her. When oh. he kissed the wife and just pulled the, that saliva trail of the color. Every oh, kiss like, begins with... Ew. Every kiss begins with... Yuck. Yeah. Um, the, again, the scurrying scared me. Uh, the sheriff, when the animals started like, okay, it, I forgot that there... Yeah, of course, there's going to be fucking other animals and shit that's got torn up and monster. Yep. And it just came out of nowhere and... Picked him up. And I was like, I got to get the fuck out of this forest, man. Forests are scary. You know, in whether, general. Whether they're evil dead forest, whether they're Lovecraftian. Because, you know, in a forest, there could be like killer animals. It could be an alien like Extro. It could be diddle trees like evil dead. It could be a slasher like Friday the 13th. Nothing good is in the woods. So are you saying, much like the water, when you go into the woods, you are lowering yourself on the food chain? I'm staying on the trail. First of all, I wouldn't go in the woods because if you go in the woods, you're going to camp or something. True, true. That's not happening. No. Nope. So, no. And I definitely don't want to go to any murder alpaca farms. Oh, no, no. That's, that's the uh, visitation of the future. But this movie was extremely gorgeous. Extremely gorgeous. Absolutely. Absolutely. Both of these films saturated in colors. And I love how you get the explanation. If you didn't get what was going on with Lavidia, you got the exposition from Chong when he makes that very creepy post-mortem yeah. recording. Like, it's everywhere. It's changing us. It's like, it doesn't want to be, it just wants to be to be here. Yep. And you're just like, fuck. <laughs> Would you say we're all doing better than Ezra at that point? Ah, uh, closing time. <laughs> so final thoughts there on Color Out of Space. I loved it. Yep. I, I can't wait. The fact that uh, Richard Stanley has already said, this is, I'm making a Lovecraft trilogy. And the next one is, I believe, the Dunwich Horror. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. I'm, I'm all for it. I'm yeah. all for it. You know, we'll be there. Hopefully, maybe it'll hit the festival rounds again. Do you watch Richard Stanley? <laughs> <laughs> now, from uh, Lovecraft <laughs> to, oh boy, a movie that we both definitely enjoy, mm -hmm. adore even, yeah, and have definitely had a history with. 1952's Mandy, also known as the color, the change of the wind. No, the crash of silence. Um, it stars uh, Vivian Lee, I believe, and it's all about, it's his British movie about a teacher who teaches young children at a school for the deaf in post-World War II Britain. That sounds like a very heady film. It is very dramatic. Oh, I like very, that. Uh, very thought-provoking. And a uh, nice little slice of life. Black is, and white. Is there any Cheddar Goblin in it? No Cheddar Goblin. Okay, well, in that case, I think our Mandy is infinitely superior than yes. that old Mandy. Yes. And as it turns out, there are fans of that old Mandy, as it turns out, yes. that live here in the Kansas City area. Yes. So before we talk about the movie, let's talk about a movie experience that we had. So we recently hosted Mandy at here at Screenland Armor. It was one of our very first Friday Night Frights, I believe. I believe so. And I make sure the yeah. sound is good. And so we if you ever come to one of our events, we always ask the question, who is going to see this movie for the very first time? And a couple of people raised their hands and two of the people that raised their hands, they're sitting on different 
level. So they weren't really together. But they were um, a little bit w more seasoned and wiser and a little bit older than our normal uh, horror clientele. But, I mean, first of all, there's nothing wrong. Horror of fans course, are all no, ages. We... But for a movie, Mandy, we weren't expecting people like over 60. Yes, at, yes. At, at, at a 10 o'clock show. Yes, something that was a little bit later. Right. So it's So it was more like, hmm. And so then... After the movie, we always ask, like, hey, what would you guys think if, you, if we talk to people in the... Well, I had to go and find out the people, the, those two uh, older people, what they thought about Mandy. And the first guy I go up to, and I go, so what you think? And he goes, that wasn't what I was expecting. And I go, no, it never is, man. We, we hear that all the time We knew Mandy. that. I mean, it's Mandy, right? And he goes, no, no, no. Um, when I looked on the website... And Mandy, I thought it was this movie from 1952 in black and white. And so I came expecting that movie. And I'm like, holy shit. Like, and it made me wonder at how long into the film, because right away it's saturated in color, yeah. for him to go, this ain't the right Mandy. Well, and it, even that before the movie, we were we had a pre-show, and in the pre-show had Nicolas Cage dancing around his tiny Elvis. It had fucking too many cooks. It had like all this weird like LSD our, shit. Our trailers, we had like Hordoraski's The Holy Mountain. I mean, we went full on weird. Yeah. Because we felt we should be preparing them for the weirdness of Mandy. And I uh, maybe at some point they had to go, this can't be right. Or why am I watching all this weirdness? Well, the minute the color comes up and like it's talking about bury me deep and shit like that, then that would be your first clue that this ain't the black and white movie about kids in fucking uh, all school for the deaf. This isn't the one we wanted, but it was the one we deserved. <laughs> so I was like, holy shit. Like, uh, sorry. Sorry, what'd you think? And he goes, I really enjoyed it. He goes, I thought that movie was very colorful, very unique, and very weird. And he goes, it reminded me of the movies from the 60s. And I was like, okay, those LSD trip yep. out movies. Yep. I'm yep. like, all right. And he goes, no, I, he goes, that, that was really good. And I go, excellent. So good. So bullet one. Bullet one, <laughs> dodge. Like Neo. And then I go up to the other lady and I go, what did you think about the movie? And she goes, well, and I go, what were you expecting? She goes, well, with the name like Mandy, I thought it was going to be some sort of like rom-com or something, some movie like Doris Day or some, something that gives without taking. Right. <laughs> On my vacation from worky. Um, and I was like, and? She goes, that was interesting. And I go, and then she goes, did you like it? And she stopped and she thought about it. And it seemed like two minutes she thinks, she was like, and I'm like sitting there on bated breath like yeah did my two for two and she goes I really like that movie and I'm like yes second goes, bullet John she goes that movie was so weird but it was she goes I never seen anything like that before and I go you know what neither have I and so like I'm glad she, she goes yeah I didn't think I was gonna like it but I liked it a lot and I go that's awesome. Again, both these movies are, you need to stick with it. Yes. I can see how it could lose some people because both movies are slow. Yes. But they're so saturated with style that it's like, man. Well, I even remember, you know, my first few times watching this and just realizing how indulgent the movie is, mm -hmm. but just how sumptuous it is as well. Yes. You know, this is a, with Mandy, unlike Color Out of Space, I think that one works as a more subtle horror with Mandy. I think it needs to be as loud as possible, as large as possible when yeah. you view it, when you sit, because it's an experience. It's just yeah. a totality. What's the word that you used to describe it? Sumptuous. Sumptuous. It's, yes. That's 100% correct. And it's definitely not for everyone. No. In fact, I, I've talked about it before. My initial uh, theatrical experience, I went in completely blind. No trailers. I knew it was a Nick Cage movie, that it was a revenge Nick Cage movie with a cult. That's all I knew. Yeah. And sold on that premise alone. Knew I was going to watch it regardless. But right. Little things like finding out that Bill Duke is in the movie when his name comes up in the credits. That was great. That I think we were both like, ah, oh, like Duke in the Because like, I know, I know Dustin was. I know you. We, you saw it first by yourself, and then you're like, we we're like, and well, and then I called you guys immediately. I was like, have you guys seen Mandy yet? And you're like, no, not yet. And I was like, we're going to go watch it again because it's very rare for me to see a movie in the theater. To then seek it out again like the next the day. The next day. Unless it was an experience. And with me, I know at least, I wanted to almost do the peripheral viewing with you all. And 
this second experience was only made better with them in the vicinity because little moments like little Thurman Merman showing up. <laughs> when I watched it the first time, that thought did not go in my head. I'm watching with them that second time. He pops up. They start laughing, and it took me <laughs> a, a, just a nano of a second to realize what you are laughing at. And I was like, why didn't I make that connection last night? But it was just that joy of then watching with you guys and then the sandwiches. <laughs> I lost it. I it, lost it. I couldn't help it. If you don't know who Thurman Merman is, you've obviously never seen the movie Bad Santa. But if you know Bad Santa, you know exactly who Thurman Merman is, right? And you know exactly who we're talking about in, in the movie. Because yes. he's sitting there and I'm like, ah! No, I, I, I try not to be loud, but at the same time, I couldn't help it because, like, He's right fucking there, he's, right? He's an adult Thurman Merman. And then when he gets dispatched, first of all, oh, first of all, the dispatching scene scary. was absolutely terrifying because we'll go into, you don't know what the fuck is happening throughout the entire no. movie. Not even up until the end do you know what the fuck is happening. And like, we know that this house is being besieged by like Cenobikers or some weird cult yep. and some shit's going down. They're all gnarly and they're heinous. And it's genuinely terrifying, the strobe light effect and the whole... Oh, yeah. But then when you have Thurman Merman sitting at the window and gets dragged away, and I'm just picturing sandwiches. Oh, I could not help but laugh. There were so many times where I'm not laughing at the movie. Laugh. I'm just laughing yeah. at the scenarios and scenes like Harry Reams. Um, when you have an action scene set to cocaine and Harry Reams, right? The 70s you've got porn. some sort of next level action and scene. When they're watching Night Beast and all of a sudden, like, fucking, like, the guy just falls out of nowhere. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. That moment, there's a couple moments in this movie with their relationship that I thought was really nice. That moment when they're watching Night Beast and they've got the little TV dinners and they're just involved. And then the, the moment when he comes back and he does his little knock knock joke. <laughs> knock knock. Who's there? Eric Estrada. Eric Estrada who? Eric Estrada from Chips. It's that goddamn what delivery. The fuck? <laughs> but there's a moment where Mandy, they're kind of cuddling together, and she just goes up and she puts her fingers through his little beard that came through at the time they were away. And it's a little moment, but it says so much about the couple. Yeah. And you spend so much time with them when the Galactus talk, the planet you, talk. You, they, you, they genuinely love each other, and it shows, and mm -hmm. you can feel that, the chemistry. Mm -hmm. And they live such, especially Mandy, such crazy lives. When she's talking about the starlings, oh, that broke my heart. I was like, oh, my God. You realize that her face, her soul, her psyche carries a lot of pain. Yes, absolutely. And you, those moments when they're on Crystal Lake, which, yes, they do live on Crystal Lake. Again, and in the Shadow Mountains. Yes. And when that oh. Lisa Frank fucking font pops out, the Shadow Mountains. I, again, during this movie, I had no nope. fucking clue what was going to happen or what I was experiencing. Because we start with Nick Cade and Bill Dukas Carruthers. And I think both me and Dustin were like, ah! And we were like, mm -hmm. And that King Crimson song as well. Was fucking the shit. Yeah. Okay, starting off from everything from the, be I, from the beginning. That quote, mm -hmm. okay, where he goes, when I'm dead, uh, no. It's like, rock and roll me when I'm dead. Rock and roll me. That is the last quote of a person who was put to death in 2005. I think his name was Dennis Robinson. He was convicted of uh, kidnapping and murder. And uh, his, those were his very last words on death row. Problematic? Yeah, you know. It makes sense with the Certainly movie. Context. I mean, it fits the context. And for being, like, very sweeping and very colorful and very slow, this is a fucking rock and roll movie yes, this is. is a rock and roll movie Jonas Johansson who delivered the score for this who passed actually right before the movie came out it's one of my favorite scores it's a great score but that it cream is. crimson song at oh. the beginning starless yeah oh it sets the tone for the film and it should be noted that Spectre Vision is responsible for both of these films and it they makes have, sense and they put out that kind the kind of film that People that grew up on genre. And Panos Cosmatos is a fanboy through and through. Yeah. I mean, this is someone that wears their influence on their sleeves. I mean, look at his dad. It would almost play with like a Neil Marshall film because he's yeah. also one of those filmmakers that you can see every movie, every genre he enjoys it's in the movie. Mm -hmm. This is the same thing. In fact, I think I even mentioned that this is the kind of movie that could be displayed upon a van 
and it would still Every play wonderfully. Every shot, her illustrations, yeah. the the establishing shots of the Shadow Mountains and Crystal Lake, um, the LSD trips with the sky, the animations, yeah, the animation, of it. yeah. I mean, and the fact that when he builds his uh, Klingon war glyph, the Batliff, the Beast, right? That's actually the F from the band Celtic Frost. I am not surprised. And so, like this, this movie is more metal than one handle hand can handle. There, I mean, mm-hmm. seriously. And it's about cults and shit, and and, and worshiping mm. cults and shit. Let's let's talk about the children of the new dawn. Genius. Do you like Jeremiah Sands? Do you like the Carpenters? Do you like the Carpenters? Would you listen to the Carpenters? So I listen to the Carpenters. I have been on this. I have seen since May fourth. I have seen at least seventy brand new films, be it older, newer, what have you. One of those movies I watched for the first time, and I cannot recommend this enough, is Larry Cohen's And God Told Me To. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's a great take on religion and cults, so it would play nicely with Mandy, and it has one of our podcast favorites, professional ghoul Richard Lynch, playing possibly the um, son of an alien hybrid. Like, it's a crazy film. Which he is in real life. Which I think he was, actually. (laughs) But when we're introduced to Jeremiah Sands... When I first saw him, just the, like the profile, I was immediately like, they're going for a Richard Lynch kind of feel immediately. Yeah. And I was shocked when I find out it's Linus Roach. From, from Law and Order! Yes. D.A. Cutter! Yes. D.A. Cutter! Dun dun! Have you now got to that point in Law and Order? Yes! How weird is it for it's you now? It's so weird. And you know what's even weirder about Linus Roach? First of all, the fact that he went, <laughs> he hung dong, right? You like the Kurt? Suck it, right? We're gonna call that a hung jury. Ah, ding dong. So, um, dong dong. So, <laughs> but did you know that Linus Roach is actually a cult leader in real life? Wait, what? I shit you not. He is a founding member and a high priest of Enlightened Next, which is has got a cult status in over twenty different countries he they practice meditation and all that nothing has been extra nefarious about right. it but nothing has really been on the up and up about it either and so yeah good for him i guess i wonder if he's Is like he total method apparently do you like linus roach music would you like to see my visitor robe about the only thing missing from this film is sateen i yeah, am pretty right? sure um his collection. His goons? Oh, my goodness. Okay. From <laughs> Thurman Merman. Yep. Then we had the one that looks like Beavis. Yep. Where he's like, where he's fucking washing his car to Celita Lindo. Ay, 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 right? And he looks like, because when he's like, <laughs> when he's burning man, he's like, <laughs> fire, fire, fire. He's very much a Beavis with a mullet. Then we had, and that was, uh, then we had the big yoked up Walter Frey with the big chainsaw, Brother Klopek. Which literally he is a Klopek. <laughs> That's a Slavic name, isn't it? Yeah. Brother Klopek, real real Christian name. Uh, Hans Hans Anderson. Uh, Hans Christian Anderson. <laughs> and so but that was one of the best fucking gags in the whole entire movie was the uh, chainsaw fight. Which is ruined in the trailer and is another reason why I'm glad the first time I saw it, I was like, oh, that's legitimately funny. I was not expecting that. Um, but he gets dispatched great, like the big old yoked up Walter Frey. And so then we have, uh, then we had Sister Lucy, mm-hmm. who I felt so bad for. And the one, technically, I'm glad that Red did spare her at the end. Yes. I yes. was happy to see that. Because like, you could tell that even when they're like, prove you love me. And he, she she had that like Unwill- fear yep. and unwilling, unwillingness and the Hasn't fact that really she was, Probably just, drank all the Kool Aid yet. Yeah, and she was just there to be a sex slave and get yeah. LSD'd up. Yeah. Then you had uh, Sister Grandma, who is the most intuitive lover. I can, I, I can intimidate. And you. also, we saw her in, in Sea Fever. In Sea Fever, yes. as, yeah. And like, D- women don't belong on the. Here, here's the cherry on top. That cherry on top. What the fuck was that? Putting what? LSD in her eye and then getting like an LSD. Bee stinger? You don't pickle your own wasps? Come on now. That's what all the kids are doing nowadays. And, and there's fucking in the cage. Not the bees! And so that was a fucked up scene, too. All of it. And then, actually, once she has been drugged, they've been kidnapped by the LS demons, the Cenobikers, even the summoning of them with the Horn of, Horn of Abraxas. Abraxas. We'll get into the weirdness of it, but then Brother Swan. Oh, no. Then his number two. 
who is just creepy, oh, just he's, awful. He's the uncle your your family doesn't let you talk to. Mm-hmm. He's the one that's going, you know, door to door. He's a giant red blip on yeah. a map. He's like, just one hundred percent creep. Creep yes. factor ten. Oh, oh, everything about them. But the whole entire cult was awful. Just the LSD and Linus Roach being all extra nasty. Honestly, I'm pretty sure I saw them on an episode of Real Sex back in the day, and I was like, yes, yes. Oh, damn it. Oh man. It's kind of a bummer. But everything that they did. And then the the Senna bikers. Those okay, so what I liked about it and it was I thought it was extremely cool, but then also sometime like I see what you're going for, is when they would talk about the mystic arts and like use the horn of Abraxas and then they'd have this strobe light effect on it and like which made me it's like is it in their minds that this is happening? The cult, or or this like, is really like a holy symbol, like the 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 what was it? The cursed saber of Abaddon, right? Which I think he just you know made as like a little shank from when they did prison, and they just added and little, jewel. little jewels and shit on it, like you would make like some fucking. I found this at a craft sale, but when they lit up, it reminded me of, and it goes even further into video game logic, yeah. Because like when there's something that you need to pick up. It sparkled there. The same thing happened when he dispatched the Cenobikers. Again, I want to go about the Cenobikers. Mm. And he finds the um, the bulletproof the vest. armor. Yeah, and it's glowing red. And his um, the Celtic Frost is glowing green. And it's like, dude, you need to collect those. You need to collect those so for on your journey. So as someone that is a gamer, yes. do you think Panos is a gamer? As oh, well absolutely. That aesthetic because in? how many... He literally leveled up multiple times in this. He gained more powers. He level. He like like when Mega Man get, be, defeats a boss and he gains their power. I was waiting for Nick Cage. Do 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 And then that thing comes up for him, and that's his his He's new got weapon. The new sword dick, right? The Cenobikers. I didn't know what the fuck was going on because this movie is so vague. It could be that they are literal monsters or they could just be these drug runners that got too much drugs in their system but I, something has to be odd about them because that one took an arrow oh, through yeah. the neck and just pulled out like it was nothing it's the drugs it had to have it's been. the drugs it had to have been and they are gnarly and again when we first saw in the theater i had no clue because no nope. we think it's the horn of abraxas and it's Right? Of course, it's going to call demons. Right. And sure enough, we thought they're LS demons, and then like they're Cenobikers because they're all spiked up and leathery and drippy, and they have such sights to ride you. You the know, the only thing that I would say is a is kind of a, a negative is there are points with the fight scenes with the Cenobikers that it's just so dark, very dark. It's hard to see. Which I understand if maybe they're hiding something budget, but. In a movie that's so saturated with color, that kind of took me by surprise. But then it made up for it with the bloodletting. A lot of bloodletting. A lot of bloodletting. Because blood he gets that evil dead uh, blood right to the face. Just yak. And then like, and then you see death by buggery. Oh, yeah. With oh, the yeah. sword we, dick. We, we, we get it hinted at in 7. We definitely get it hinted at it here. Um, now, my thing is the, the rage cage freakout that we get. Um, in this film is tough. And I remember distinctly, both the times I saw this, people were laughing. Mm-hmm. And it really bothered me because I think it's pretty obvious that it might start funny for some people. And again, those Rage of the Cagers. But it's so sad because he's processing the fact that he just saw his wife, his the, the his best friend in the world. The love of the absolute love of the only person in his life. Burned alive. Horribly. Savage. Horribly. And it was fucked up because Jeremiah is saying like you can have your whore back. And I want to talk about like that whole like because there, that was one of the most uncomfortable and breathtaking scenes when he's talking with Mandy and she's drugged up. But most definitely. The that scene when he's going through the rage cage, the first time I saw it and he's sitting there looking wild-eyed in his underwear, and he's all bloodied and shit. And I was like, oh, shit, here it, here comes. it comes. And I laughed for about a minute. Not even a minute, maybe 30 seconds. I was like, yeah, it's going nuts. But then I stopped la- like almost instantaneously, and I felt so bad for him because he legit 
was going through some pain and he's literally choking himself because he doesn't want to, to drink. drink. Nope. But he needs to drink. He, he, he doesn't mm. know what else to do. And it's that whole sadness and pain. And when he starts littering those guttural screams, like those weren't not the bee screams. Those no, came from that's, those came from the soul. That's and, the moonstruck, man. Yeah, that's my hand. That was great. Nicolas Cage acted so well in this movie. Rage Cage or not, he yeah. did what the script needed to be. No, I agree. A hundred and ten percent. And I think at that point though, that's when the revenge really starts to kick in. Absolutely. That's when he picks up the Reaper. That's when he makes the beast. And that's when the roaring rampage of revenge kicks in. And that's when, again, taking out the Cenobikers, tracking Richard Brake as the, as the chemist. Which is such, and I love Richard Brake because he's yeah. a great actor. But there was something otherworldly about every person you met. Carruthers was even otherworldly, even though he was the most grounded person. Can't you read with the sign that says fuck off on his door, right? And did you notice he had Cheddar Goblin yep. right there too? But like... When we are introduced to the chemist and the fact that, like, he's using this blotter acid with his bare hands. I don't know too much about drugs, but I know no, that's probably that would, not a bad thing. That would that's kill a bad thing. you. Okay. That, would, that amount that he did and his own bare hands would melt your brain. Okay. Like, fizzle. And he's doing it like it was nothing. And the fact that he had a tiger and the fact that he could psychically talk to Nicolas Cage, there had to have been something more to Why that Why not? Character. Why not? Yeah. But all the characters in this, again, like when we're introduced to the cult and we just see their weird machinations and when in Mandy is meet, met with uh, Sister Grandma for the first time. That like, little, that little I, interaction at the, the store. So you like reading books? You like stuff where you live? And I get with Mandy when she just cuts it off really immediately. Like, listen, the, the transaction has already happened. You've paid for your stuff. I'm going to get back to my thing. You get back to your thing. Let's move along. Yeah. I get that. Yeah, and it's not even an anxiety thing. Some fun, sometimes <laughs> customers fucking suck, you know? You, if you work retail, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I don't, I don't need no conversation. I just want some transaction. And that gets us to a number of things here. The conversation that Jeremiah has with Mandy where you get the, the face transfixing. That blew my mind because that was such a haunting scene. This whole movie is just so saturated and every single corner of this film is filled with color and just imagery but i felt like i was going on some sort of weird lsd trip when he was talking to like we're all the same children and like it was the face on top of the face and they just kind of melded where i don't know who was talking to and andrea riseborough has a very haunting face yes, in does. general you know it's very it's very it's it's i'm not saying it's weird or ugly or beautiful no, or no, anything no. but just, it's, it's just it's a, it's a very striking haunting face and then when you add the linus roach to it and him being extremely creepy yes it adds so much mystique to the movie where you again what the fuck is happening what is going on are are we on another world and also it just keeps going yeah and going is it's almost like a long each scene is long to the point of uncomfortableness yep. and that's what it's trying to make you feel and it, it did it works it's much more significant than gaspar noah cuz like yeah. He wants to make you uncomfortable, and he'll put some fucking terrible shit, but this makes your mind uncomfortable. But I will come back to Mandy. I'm not coming back to Irreversible. <laughs> right, right, right. We can have a moody movie party for Mandy, not Irreversible. No, no. That would, that would not no, be No, that well. would not be good. Um, finally, when Red confronts the cult, we do get the eventual breakdown. We get to see the beast being used. But before we get to Mandy, or before we get to him going to the cult, is this your music? Yeah, what do you think? <laughs> this song sucks. And Her. then he goes, but you don't want to. And he's trying to like, and like everybody's like, and then he pulls a Frank Booth. He pulls the Frank Booth. Don't you fucking look at me. Don't you fucking look at me. <sighs> right? And I'm waiting for Brother Klopek. Make love to Bobby Peru. You know, and it's just like. Well, her laughter with him. Just that <laughs> it gets harder and more harsh, and it's cathartic. And, and he's there, tell me what to do. Tell me what to do. Tell me what to do. He's a. Piss 
poor cult leader. Yeah, he's not good. He's not good. There's a reason why they're stock. And very eh. toxic masculinity. And I love the fact that it's set in the 80s, but it's super timeless. Oh, absolutely. And they set it establishing shots with the Ronald Reagan talking and like yep. everything is, there's nothing modern. There's nothing really new, but it, seems, it doesn't seem like it's out of place. No, well, and it's also, it's another time. Another place. Because as we see in multiple shots, they're in... Maybe a uh, Frazetti painting, yeah. potentially, just with the skyfall and the, the, the multiple planets. So it's not our Earth. No. So that's okay, because that we, we're existing somewhere else. We're getting a, a tale that's being told that's maybe been passed down to generations. Yeah, but it's, it, it's a great... But, but then when you add the animation, the very heavy metal est- aesthetics of it... It's, it's, it's all of those things and then some that just definitely add the coolness vibe to it. Mm-hmm. Um, but we are going to have to wrap it up here because uh, they do have trivia coming in. So, so much cocaine. A lot of cocaine. So much drugs he did. Cocaine, LSD. I'm not going to say that you should watch this movie sober, but I'm just saying that if you watch it enhanced, it might make it better, potentially. But then the you think Jeremiah is this end-all, be-all, and you think he might have magical powers. Right. But then like, come on, man, I'll suck your dick. Come on. Ah, I didn't say it lost me, but I was like, fuck him up, Nicolas Cage. Fuck him up. That toxic fucking... And he goes straight Jason Voorhees on him, gives him the head squeeze, which leads us to the ending of the film, which is it's haunting, it's sad, he's carried out his revenge, but he still doesn't have Mandy. He only has the memory. And he's gone full berserk. Yeah. Because that last, like... He's he's lost it. Crazy shot. His brain is fried. Between the drugs and the revenge, revenge. and the just the tragedy, he's yeah. gone. Yeah. He's gone. We, we we probably won't be seeing a Mandy too. Nope. The tiger ran off into the forest, just like in the chemist. That is correct. Now, final thoughts on Mandy here, genius. I love it. I love it. I'm te- I'm curious to see Code of Silence, the other 1952 Mandy. To make the, the trilogy complete. Right. Well, hopefully you all enjoyed Raging the Cage. Um, you, you can never go wrong with the Nick Cage film. Uh-uh. Now, I know here our next Shutter shout-out is going to be falling on Halloween. Yes, so we're going to do something spooky. And special and kitty-friendly. Yes. We're going to try and figure out some of the best movies you can watch with your younger ones on this wonderful Halloween season that don't suck, that actually are good, scary, and proper. So don't worry. No dong will be hung. No. The next Shutter shout out. <laughs> so until that next time, this is Greg D. And I like the Carpenters. <laughs> we'll see you in your dreams. Grr.